right, I'll start um, with the questions now. We've got about 15 minutes. The first one that came in, um, I think this is a general question that any of the speakers could address. To what extent is climate change affecting the nutrient situation in Lake Erie? Comments on that from the speakers? Well, yeah, this is Greg Labarge. Uh, just to chime in, I, I think uh, certainly as we look at uh, climate change or really the more frequent uh, heavy rainfalls that we've had, it certainly um, as we look at the water monitoring for water quality going into Lake Erie, you see that there's really three or four events throughout the year where a majority of that phosphorus is deposited in the lake. So certainly those heavy rainfall events and Obviously, uh, looking at 2011 versus 2012, uh, certainly weather had a, a tremendous impact uh, as far as uh, those two years were concerned. So uh, it, it certainly is a, something that we have to deal with in the mix of what we're doing as far as practice adaptation. Uh, but, you know, a lot of us are looking at it. We can't just use that as an excuse that we need to uh, try and implement things uh, that will um, you know, better economics as well as uh, better water quality. This is John Oster adding uh, to those comments. Uh, on the retail side, I sit here and watch our retail people working on a day-to-day -day basis, and particularly this time of year, they're in constant contact with the farmer who is actually in, most cases, in his field application rig. Uh, and he, we're spreading right ahead of him, uh, P and K, uh, this fall, such as on the field that we looked at, and we know that immediately following us, he's going to come in and incorporate that. If if we see a rain coming, if we got bad weather moving in, we begin to act like an air traffic controller here. We keep running our rigs right in front of them. We run as long as we can. They incorporate as long as they can, and then when the rain comes, we shut off. I to support uh, both Greg's and John's comments there uh, with respect to climate. Uh, climate, of course, is a big factor there, and you know, and patterns of rainfall, particularly in the winter, are important uh, in explaining what's what's going on in terms of loading to uh, Lake Erie. I would point out, I guess, the uh, uh, official uh, climate model projections uh, dealing with uh, climate change do predict in North America an increased frequency of, of, and severity of winter storms, uh, which is precisely what causes some of these runoff issues, making it all the more important to, uh, as John explained there, uh, make sure that our nutrient management pays due attention to the weather. All right, thank you. Um, the next question, why no discussion about nitrogen deposition both wet and dry. Is it so insignificant from a loading perspective? Um, I'll address that question. This is Greg Labarge again. And uh, from the standpoint of nitrogen, certainly it is a concern. Certainly we do see a lot of nitrogen loss. Uh, but what we're really has caused the discussion to occur here in Ohio is related to that whole uh, algae growth and algae bloom on the lake. And so what triggers that in a freshwater system is the phosphorus concentration. So that's really why we are so focused in on phosphorus as a discussion, although uh, we continue to address nitrogen, uh, just uh, uh, didn't seem uh, with the limited time today something that we needed to or wanted to spend a lot of time on. This is John Oster adding to what uh, Greg said. Uh, this area that we're describing in these maps uh, is the soil is of such a type of nature that there really is not a lot of fall applied, applied ammonia. Uh, we find that uh, we're mainly spring applying our nitrogen as uh, UAN, sometimes ammonia, sometimes as urea. Uh, but, but a lot of times we're going in and near the row on either a two-by-two -two placement or immediately in a row with a pop-up fertilizer. Uh, we... We take a particular aim on that, but we only do that, of course, in the year when we're growing the corn. And we do follow the mid-state, uh, tri-state recommendations of uh, whether it be 1.2, 1.3 pounds of actual in per uh, 
per targeted bushel of corn. So our placement is in the spring to the growing plant, and we're doing a pretty good job on nitrogen. It is important to the to the question. It's an excellent question. Very important. We do monitor our nitrogen quite quite well, but not in this presentation. Okay, moving on. Um, there was a question for Tom on the water quality index, which he answered in the chat box. So if you're looking for that answer, um, you can check there. And the next question, could no-till be significantly affecting the amount of phosphorus running off since a, nat since off since a natural barrier at the soil surface is formed when ground isn't tilled that allows for more runoff? I would I would like to take that. Uh, this is Oster again. Uh, No-till is has has been a real phenomenon. We I've seen it go from uh, maybe 10% no-till to 90% conventional till 20 years ago to a complete opposite of that. The vast majority of our soils here in northern Ohio have some form of conservation till on them. Uh, whether it uh, it be a complete tillage or moldboard, and that's not happening very much. It very definitely affects phosphorus runoff, and uh, we're we're looking hard at that. What we like to do is come by and immediately incorporate with either disking or harrowing right behind the uh, fertilizer spreader. And your to your point is well taken. It has a tremendous impact, we believe, on the amount of phosphorus that uh, that can actually leave the field. One point I'd like to make on that, as Tom Brolson is speaking, I guess, is that uh, no-till has been, a, I think, a key to uh, reducing soil erosion and the loss of particulate phosphorus forms from uh, agricultural soils. So it's important to keep that in mind, but at the same time, the research does not support that no-till uh, effectively reduces the concentration of dissolved phosphorus in runoff. And in fact, if you combine with no-till no with with a surface broadcast application, you may actually increase it. So we, we really need to be looking very closely at tillage practices. We want that optimum soil quality that improves infiltration of water and reduces the amount of runoff. Uh, at the same time, within those systems, we need to find ways to ensure that the phosphorus that we apply does get below the soil surface. And uh, Greg Labarge, just to chime in on that uh, topic, uh, really what we what we see potentially as far as the problem with no-till is some of the preferential flow that you might have through uh, wormholes and so forth directly to tile. But uh, you know, if you balance that with uh, surface losses uh, and runoff, uh, you can get uh, losses there as well. So. Uh, we probably need to focus in more on the placement uh, issues as it relates to no-till, just as Tom was describing. All right, moving on. Do you consider buffers around a site to contain nutrients on the site? Tom Brooks, I guess I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, you know, buffers around uh, around farm fields can be useful for for some reason, uh, and again, for uh, so you know, if, if there is sediment or a particulate phosphorus in runoff water, I think buffers have some level of efficacy. You have to keep in mind that when uh, when you look at the Heidelberg uh, University data and uh, that uh, monitors the rivers. It's fairly clear there that the highest concentrations and the highest amounts of loss of dissolved phosphorus happen during the times where the water is flowing fast. And in those instances, buffers really have to be very wide in order for them to, for, for them to have any effect. And so I'm, I'm not convinced that, uh, that buffers are a particularly strong solution for the dissolved phosphorus issue. And I'd agree with what Tom's saying. I mean, basically, buffers do a tremendous job from a sediment uh, standpoint and sediment reduction, but uh, soluble nutrients flowing past that uh, blade of grass or whatever really aren't going to be pulled out uh, through that buffer. And to wrap that up on that question, this is John Oster. Uh, what you got to look at, I believe, on buffers, too, is the, is the slope factor. On the field that we looked at in my presentation, uh, very low uh, near the creek, I'm not so sure a buffer would help you there. Your issue there is more flooding than it would be a sudden influx of water because that field is very, very flat. 
and most of the soil, uh, most of the fields we talked about here in this watershed are very, very flat. This used to be a swamp area, and it was drained through tiling. So, but when you get in the Ohio River and larger, uh, Miss- the whole Mississippi River flowage, where you get into highly erodible soils, buffers can really, really make a difference. Not so here so much in northern Ohio, though. All right, next question. When you variable rate apply MAP, how do you handle the subsequent N application given that MAP also contains N? I can take that. This is John again. We do factor that in. The 11.52.0, uh, by the time you start breaking it down to maybe 150 pounds per acre, of course, you're getting down pretty small because your factor conversion factor then would be 0. 0.075 times 11. Uh, but we do take those couple of units of nitrogen into effect with our overall recommendation, uh, even though that nitrogen may not sequester itself in the soil until we go to the corn crop the second year. Uh, we still do figure it in. So we'd, we'd rather miss a little bit on the low side, if you will, and then later as we see the crop develop, if we're having an extremely good year, the farmer always has the option of coming in uh, at side dress and uh, supplementally applying a little bit more in uh, to that growing crop. Excellent question, though. Okay, John, this question is for you as well. When soil sampling, do you take a composite sample at each of your data sites, and how often do you sample? In order for the data site to be pure, we we take a composite sample, but it's right there at the data site. We we uh, we pull four probes and then uh, split them and combine them into one one sample that goes to the lab. It's right on top of that data site. What was the next part of the question? How often do you sample? Thank you. We sample every two years uh, because our recommendation is, is on a two-year basis. And with uh, 90% of our crops here being a, a corn to bean or wheat to bean rotation, uh, we find that to be very, very good because we get one complete, uh, one complete uh, cycle that way. Now, with one exception, if they're, going, if they're working wheat into it, like a corn, bean, wheat, bean, wheat, corn, bean, you know, I'm, I'm getting myself confused, but you get my point. If we're going three years and on, on the customer's request, we would, we would move to a three-year cycle, and then our recommendation would reflect a recommendation for wheat along with the corn, along with the beans. Okay. Next question is, why have K not been followed like N and P? Guessing that means the concern with um, there hasn't been the concern with potassium applications as with um, nitrogen or phosphorus. Yeah, I, I can take this. That this is uh, Greg Labarge again. Uh, for, just from a, a potassium or potash standpoint, uh, we don't see the water quality concerns, uh, but certainly it's an economic concern, and you can see how John was using. Uh, you know, variable rate applications to make decisions on the, the individual field that he was working in there. So uh, certainly from a crop production standpoint, it's port- important. Uh, certainly from uh, a water quality standpoint, it's not one that we focus in on as far as a nutrient. Tom Brosman, I'll make one comment on that as well. Uh, you know, it, it's clearly that, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus both have environmental impacts, so they get followed pretty intensely. but. Uh, an important point to keep in mind is that uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus use efficiency can be limited if uh, the t- soil potassium is too low. So potassium can be an important ingredient if it's limiting crop yields. It's going to be um, uh, potentially limiting efficiencies and I'll potentially even increasing losses of both nitrogen and phosphorus. Okay. Um The next question has to do with dietary manipulation on swine and poultry diets um, that could contribute to the reduction on risk of nutrient buildup in solid solid manure, maybe through in solid through manure application to cropping soils. Well, I'm no, uh, Tom Brosma here, I'm no expert on um, swine and poultry diets uh, necessarily, but I know that the, uh, uh, in, in Ontario, uh, 
Canada, we are, are certainly using a lot more phytase in those diets, and along with the phytase, a reduced input of uh, mineral phosphate uh, into the feed. And uh, if you look at that in terms of the farm's nutrient balance, the, uh, the amount of surplus phosphorus that's available to go onto the land can get reduced quite dramatically uh, when you simply feed more efficiently for those nutrients through the use of those kind of tools. So, so really when you talk about it from a manure standpoint, uh, you want that manure test to be off of uh, those samples, particularly as you're changing dietary needs and know what you're putting out there and how it relates to crop production. All right, time for one last question. Um, if we don't get to your question again, then um, they will be posted on the website. Um, can you discuss manure versus commercial fertilizer and nutrient uptake rates? Well, Tom Brosma here. I guess uh, you know, for our nutrient stewardship, one of our first principles of right source is that uh, you utilize the sources that are available to you. And so, if manure is available to you, you number one, uh, you take that manure and uh, each each area. Uh, each, no matter what state you're in, there will be recommendations as to the availability of the nutrients in that manure. You can get an analysis and uh, you need to account for the nutrients that are in there. The manure is one, uh, one commodity you're applying to your soil. It's got a fixed ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium to other nutrients. Um, it's not necessarily going to be the case that the needs for all nutrients are met. If you are meeting the new needs for all nutrients, you're probably applying some of them in surplus as well. So it's an important uh, component for our nutrient stewardship to be paying attention to the nutrient value of the manures that, you're, uh, that you have available. 